May our hearts, our minds, and our ears be open to what God would be revealing to us through this, the reading and hearing of his word given to us. And today's scripture comes in one of my favorite, a part of one of my favorite sections of the Bible, which is Matthew's, the Gospel of Matthew's, Sermon on the Mount, chapters 5 through 7 of the Gospel of Matthew. And personally, I believe if you, if you want the abridged version of what it means to be a Christian and a person of faith, then read the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew's version of that. Because I believe that is Jesus' teaching of what it means to be a Christian and how God, we allow God through the Holy Spirit to transform our lives and what it looks like when he does that. And this is coming, our reading today is coming from Matthew chapter 6, verses 1 through 15, which is just about in the center of this Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus starts with this teaching. Actually, he's continuing it on, but he says this, Beware of practicing your piety before others in order to be seen by them. For then you have no reward from your Father in heaven. So whenever you give alms, do not sound a trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, so that they may be praised by others. As truly I tell you, they have received their reward. But when you give alms, which is charity, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that the, your alms may be done in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And whenever you pray, do not be like the hypocrites. They love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners so that they may be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received the reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who sees and who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. When you are praying, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them. For your Father knows what you need before you ask. And Jesus says, pray this way, our Father in heaven. We might, this might sound familiar. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not bring us to the time of trial, but rescue us from the evil one. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Church, this is the word of God proclaimed aloud so the world may hear his good news. Thanks be to God. Amen. I love you guys actually look me in the eyes. I know I say that about every week. But I've had folks who, when I do that, when I look around, go, they're like, if the preacher doesn't see me, he doesn't know I'm here. But did you guys know that preachers have a secret weapon? We have a secret weapon when, say, the room is loud, whatever we're in, and we need to get people's attention. Do you want to know what that secret weapon is? <laughs> well, if I had that control of God, that'd be great, but that's not quite the secret weapon. Now, our secret weapon is all we have to do is say aloud, who'd like to pray? And you know what happens as soon as we ask who'd like to pray? Everybody starts looking down. If they have a book or folder in their hand, they go, if he can't see me, he's not going to call on me. Well, those who've been in meetings with me know when I ask that and nobody does anything, I just sit there. Eventually, somebody prays. That's our secret weapon. As soon as, the, as, I said, as soon as that question is asked, the room gets silent. People stop looking at the pastor, and they look all around. Well, last week, we talked about, and we started a sermon series called Practical Prayer, and we talked to last week about why we pray. And we pray to get to know the heart of God. We pray to be able to grow in our relationship with God. And we pray so that our lives might be transformed 
into the ways and into the will of God. Sometimes people approach prayer like they approach a vending machine. You put a dollar in, you pick F4, and the Snickers bar comes out. Sometimes prayer is like that. We, we go to God in prayer, we ask for a bunch of things, and we expect whatever we ask for to come to us. But prayer is not exactly like that. Prayer is not us trying to change God's will, but God. prayer is God's way of changing our will to his. And because of that, prayer is vitally important to our faith. It's vitally important if we want to have a deep and intimate, life-transforming relationship with God. Prayer is vitally important for the church. If we desire our church to be one that changes lives for Jesus Christ, that introduces people to him and help them grow, what I will tell you is we will have no idea what to do, how to do it, where to go, who to see, if we're not praying together. Because prayer instructs us on God's will and changes our will and transforms it to his. And all that's good and well, and that's kind of easy to understand about why we pray. But as I mentioned a little bit ago, with everybody, when you ask them to pray, they start looking around not wanting the preacher to call on them. It's a whole other ball game, a whole other story when we start talking about how to pray. How to pray. And maybe there's been times when someone has asked you to pray, whether it's in a committee meeting, a Bible study, or whatever it is, and you, what starts going through your mind is what's going through this guy's, what this guy is saying on the video that we're about to watch. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Bye. Jesus. They want me to pray in church on Sunday. We gotta practice. It's gotta sound good, Jesus. No, it's gotta sound great. This is my one shot. I've gotta inspire them. I've gotta impress them. Let's pray. It's a lot harder than it looks. Sh shall we pray? Sure. Let's try faster. Eyes open or eyes closed? Eyes closed, I pass out. Eyes open, I throw up. <laughs> Our Father, who art in heaven, forgive us sinners, prepare us for the end times. Father God, just show us, Father God, all the Father God ways, Father God, that Father God, you, Father God, our Father God, with us. Now is the part where we play music during the prayer. And now we pause for a moment to confess our sins. And moving right along. Is that too fast? Pray that. It is that was way too fast for the confession of okay. our sins part. Way too fast. Oftentimes, when we're asked to pray or when we're called out to pray, or voluntold to pray, that's a good army term there, we're filled with questions, we're filled with anxieties, we're filled with fears, like, how am I going to pray? Am I going to say the right words? Because, you know... I don't know all those big, fancy, $3 biblical and theological words they taught my pastor in seminary. Words like superlapsarianism. Did you guys know that's a word? I didn't either until I went to seminary. There's also super irrigation. You ever heard of that? That's not where you just overwater your yard. It's that, there's an actual meaning to it. And folks, they get worried because they don't know all these big fancy things. They don't think they've learned enough. And then people worry, am I praying? Am I going to pray about the right things? Does God, does God really want to hear about the small things? You know, shouldn't I save up my prayers? Because, you know, sometimes we act like we only get so many of them. Should I save them up for the big things, for when I really need them? No. Good, good try. Are there questions like, have I even earned the right to talk to God? Would he even want to hear from me? And I've done, I've done some things. How do we know we're doing it right? 
We wish that there might be some secret formula or some, some way to pray that might make it more holy, more special. Or maybe we can have this certain way of doing it that makes it more likely to be heard from God. I've heard questions like this and many, many more from folks who've come to me and asked me about prayer. And then, you know, it's something really funny with Jesus. Jesus doesn't, Jesus likes to, what I call, up the ante. And that's what he's doing all throughout this Sermon on the Mount, all throughout the Beatitudes that come before this, and all of his teachings. Jesus is taking those Old Testament moral laws that are already hard enough to follow and then making them even tougher. Because with Jesus, it's no longer about just not doing something. It's also now about not having the intent or the desire to do something bad. Jesus likes to up the ante. We're going to see that. I'm going to read two verses for you real fast. They're going to be up on the screen. The first is coming from the, from the first verse in chapter 6, where Jesus says, Beware of practicing your piety. Beware of practicing your piety before others in order you might be seen by them. Because then if you do that, you'll have no reward in heaven, because you've already gotten your reward here. Practicing your piety is a way of saying, doing good works, good deeds, of following God's lead through the Holy Spirit and doing the things of Jesus. And Jesus says, beware of doing those things in public. And then the next verse, and this one's a scary one for people, and whenever you do pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners so that they might be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they've received their reward. And I've had folks uh, use this set of verses to tell me, see, I'm not going to pray in public. It tells me to go in my room and pray and shut the door. I usually tell them, yeah, Jesus is using hyperbole here as a method of teaching, a way of teaching. He's not saying you never pray in public. What he's saying is do it for the right reason. Do it to connect with him. Don't do it so that other people might see how smart you are or how holy you sound. Don't do it for them, the folks around you. Do it for God. And there's good news, good, good news in that. But we read these words... We read this set of scripture, and we use these words like hypocrite. And I don't know about you, I don't like to be seen as a hypocrite. I don't want my friends that know me to think of me as that. And then we read this set of scripture, and all of a sudden, it's not just about being seen as a hypocrite in front of our friends. But Jesus ups the ante, takes, takes the fear of prayer to a whole new level when he talks about not being a hypocrite in front of God. I can understand why some people might be a little worried or concerned about praying in front of others when they read stuff like this. Because being hypocritical in front of God, I don't know about you, but that sounds scary. It's not something I ever want or desire to be labeled as. But if prayer, if prayer was such a vital part, or since it is such a vital part of our faith and vital and growing in our relationship with God, why does it seem so complicated? And why does Jesus seem to put such high stakes on it without really giving us a whole download of information about it. We like to have lots of information. Well, I've got some bad news about prayer, and I've got some good news. And I'm going to start with the bad news. I always like to end on the upbeat thing. And the bad news is this. Prayer is 100% absolutely necessary for a growing faith in Jesus Christ. It is absolutely 100% necessary. Now, public prayer and, you know, being called out and all that kind of stuff, I, that's not 100% necessary. Although it 
I'm going to encourage you to do it when, when, when you're asked. But that's the bad news. Prayer is necessary. It's bad because we don't want to look like that hypocrite in front of God. As I mentioned last week, for those that were here, prayer is so important that without it, without a fervent prayer life, the heart of faith, the heart of our faith is barely beating Without that strong connection with God through prayer, and we're going to talk about how instead the hows of prayer in a little bit, but without that, the heart of faith is barely beating. It is necessary, it is absolutely necessary for each and every one of us to make prayer with God, time with God, connecting with God in that way a part of our daily lives. And I'm not talking about the prayer you pray when you wake up, thank God I'm awake. A couple prayers before a meal and then prayer before bed. I'm talking about prayer that lasts throughout the day. Prayer that opens our eyes to God around us. And we're going to talk next week about how God answers prayers. But it's necessary. But the good news is this, and it's going to be up on the screen. The good news is this, how to pray Next one, I think. How to pray, it's a heart thing. It's not a vocabulary thing. How we pray is setting our heart in the right position, in the right condition to enter into time with God. It's not about saying the right words, having the right formula, doing the right model, or sounding very special. The good news is that the how of prayer, it's a hard thing. It is not a vocabulary thing. See, prayer is something that must come from the depths of who we are. It must come from the depths of our hearts. And long and dense words are just not important for prayer. I, I have worked with folks and worked with other pastors and worked with different, different people across uh, my time in ministry where I'll be having a conversation, and we're talking like this, but as soon as they start praying, they start going to these, thou's, thines, and all these other kind of things. And I'll say, if, if you pray that way, and it works for you, and that helps deepen your connection with God, by all means, do it. But it's not necessary. The these, thou's, and thines are not necessary for prayer. If it helps you, that's great. Keep on. But it's not necessary. Don't feel bad if you're not throwing those big words or the fancy words of the King James Version language in when you pray. God doesn't care about that nearly as much as he cares about the heart and why. And that's what Jesus is addressing in today's scripture. He's addressing the heart and the reason why we pray and Jesus says he's making this contrast between people that pray and do the religious-looking things so they can get the attention and the praise of others. He's comparing those to what true disciples look like. That's one of the reasons I believe that this Sermon on the Mount is an instruction on the Christian life. And this little portion of that larger instruction, he's teaching us how to pray so that we might know God more deeply and that we may be transformed by him. So I'll say this, just as a Christian life without prayer is barely alive, a life that's not being open and being transformed by the Holy Spirit and conformed into the image of Christ, that should make us stop. If we don't see that happening, that should make us stop and pause and ask some questions about where we are in our faith and our relationship with God, too. Because that's what this is about. He's trying to teach us how we open ourselves up, how we grow in relationship with God, how we connect with God. And it's not about what anybody besides you, around you, thinks. Jesus is warning is warning his followers against praying like, well, the guy in our video was getting all worked up. And yes, that's hyperbole, I know. I don't think any of you go and do this when I ask you to pray. But he's warning his people, he's warning his followers, don't 
do it for other people. Remember who your audience is. Remember who you're trying to build that relationship with, and that's God, the Father. And Jesus is encouraging to have us to have a certain attitude when we pray. And it's an attitude of openness and humility. An attitude of openness to God, how God will work in us, and an attitude of humility. And humility and, and humbleness are things that are not always celebrated in Western culture in the United States. Unless we look at somebody and say, man, they came from really humble conditions, but look at them now, they're shining. We like that. But I think it's because we don't fully understand humility, and this is just a little sidetrack real fast. The thing about humility is humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's not putting yourself down. Humility is thinking of yourself less. It's not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. We'll get to what that means a little bit later. Well, for those that know me and have seen me interact with my kids, I love them. I love my kids to death, and they're both in here. But the truth is, especially when they were younger, and still, this happens sometimes still, I don't always understand what they're trying to tell me. Sometimes they come, and they're trying to describe something to me, and they're using these made-up words. Or they're using words that are not really describing what they're trying to get across. It makes sense to them, but it does not make sense to me. Sometimes our prayer life is like that with God. Sometimes there are moments when we just go to God and we just bleh, throw it out there and let God make sense of what we're trying to say and are the feelings and the depth of our hearts. It's just like with my boys when they're coming up and they are trying to tell me something and I don't understand what they're saying. I don't care that I don't understand. I'm just excited and happy that they want to come and share something with me that they're excited about. I love that they want to run to mom or dad and just blurt out whatever it is that they want to share. And it's like that with God. It's exactly how it is with God and us. God is like the parent who is just happy to hear their toddler, their elementary kids, age kid, or for those that have kids that are older than me, they're adult kids. God is like a parent who just loves their kids to come and say something to them, to pick up the phone and to call and say, Mom, Dad, I was thinking about you. Mom, Dad, I love you. Maybe even, Mom, Dad, I really, really messed up. And I need, need your help. Parents don't care that their kids can't get the right words out to express everything. They're just glad when the phone rings or they get the letter or they have, one, have the kid drop by. That is what it is like with us and God. God doesn't care that we have the right words, and God doesn't care if we can barely get the words out through the tears. Just think about it. How many of you would require your child to come and talk to you something like this when they wanted to say something? Like, dearest mother and most venerable father, may I beseech thy parental presence on this most pleasant of evenings so that I may speaketh to thee about the trouble that lingereth in the depths of this heart of mine. I don't know about you, but if my child came up and said something like that me, to me, first I'd laugh because I'd think they were joking. Especially after say, preaching this sermon, if they try to do that, I'm really going to laugh at them. No, we don't expect that. We don't demand it, and God doesn't expect it nor demand it of us. Because you know, that is a simply ridiculous Thing. simply a ridiculous way for those of us. Now, if we were in, in the 16th, 17th century in England and we spoke and we said a prayer like that, that would make sense. But we're not there anymore. 
Well, we were never there. I hope not anyway. No parents, thank God. They're just happy when we come and say, we need you. We messed up. Help us to know you more, whatever it may be. Because God loves to hear the cries of our heart. God loves to hear the cries of our heart. Whether we're giving praise for something great that just happened or we're sobbing in heartache. God loves to hear the cries of your heart. And I've heard a number, way too many people say this, that, you know, I don't pray all the time because I only pray for the big things. I mentioned this a little bit ago. I only pray for the big things, the things I really need God's help with. Well, I'm going to say, if, if you're only praying to God when you really need help, you're not going to find God's help. Not because he's not trying to help you, but because you haven't been doing the work from the beginning to be able to see him and recognize him and hear him. Relationships take work. Any folks who have been married can tell you that. Relationships take work, and they take communication with one another. If you only talk to your spouse when you needed money, what do you think your spouse is going to do when you ask for money? Good job. Good answer. They're going to probably look at you and be like, hmm, nice. Here's some more good news about prayer. This could be up on the screen. This is coming from the letter to the Romans that Paul wrote. It's coming from Romans 8, 26. And for those that, that just can't seem to find the right words, this is good news for you. As Paul says, the Spirit comes in our weakness. That's the Holy Spirit. That's God. He comes in our weakness. We don't know what we should pray, but the Spirit pleads our case with unexpressed groans. When we don't know what to say, and I've been there. I've been there. I was there a little over a year ago when I got the phone call that my father passed away. I had no clue what to say. I couldn't get a word out that made sense. I just closed my eyes and I said, God, help and I felt that presence. God will plead on our behalf when we don't know what to say. The Holy Spirit will. Don't wait until you have the right words. Don't wait until that big thing comes that you really need God's help for to start building that relationship because that's just not how relationships work. And we were not created to only see God when we need him. We were created to be in community with God from the very beginning. We see that from the beginning of the Bible in Genesis till the end and Revelation and everywhere in between. The Bible, in a part, is a book about God constantly trying to reach down to folks like you and me and get us to see him and to recognize him and to hear him and to be in relationship with him. And I've said a lot about there not being particular models or particular things about prayer, way, particular ways to pray that are any better than any others, and there's not. But when I do get questions about, you know, how am I supposed to pray? What's a good way to pray? What's a good way to get started? I usually point people to two ways of praying, two models of praying that I think are good models that can that are a start and learning how to communicate with God and deepen our prayer lives. And the first one is one that we say every Sunday. And that's the Lord's Prayer. And I passed that out to you, to you guys, where I didn't. The ushers did in the back on that little white sheet and it has the Lord's Prayer. And what I encourage you to do is to take that and put it somewhere. Put it somewhere where you're going to see it. Every day, whether it's taped to your mirror, sitting somewhere in your kitchen, by your coffee maker, if you're like me, put it somewhere where you're going to see it 
And when you see it, stop and pray it. Not every prayer has to be what we call extemporaneous, which is just off the cuff. Some forms and models of prayer are good that help us deepen our lives and our spiritual connection with God. And the Lord's Prayer is one of them. Then as you're praying that prayer, what I challenge you to do is think for a line or two that sticks out to you. And stop and listen. Listen to what God might be revealing to you about that line or two. It might be, hallowed be thy name. It might be thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. It might be the tough one, you know, we forgive our trespasses. We forgive the tr trespasses against others as they forgive us. That's the tough part about that prayer, I think. Stop and meditate on it. Because what I can promise you is if you stop and if you open yourself up to God, he will speak to you. It might not come through audible words, and it might. It might come through a feeling. It might come through an image. It might come through in however God decides to speak to you. And the other formula that I've shared with you is on the back of that sheet of paper. And it's called the ACTS prayer, A-C-T-S. And it just stands for A, which is adoration. C, confession. T, thanksgiving. And S, supplication. I'm going to briefly talk about those, and then we're going to move on. If you're first starting in prayer, or you want to deepen your prayer life, I encourage you with this formula, too. But before you say a word, the first thing I encourage you to do is to stop and sit in silence for a minute or two. Because if you notice, before the pastoral prayer, before any pastoral prayer I pray, or really almost any prayer that I pray, especially in a group but also alone, you'll notice I'm quiet. I don't jump right into the prayer. And it's not because I'm collecting my thoughts and trying to figure out what to say. It's because I'm creating, intentionally creating time to listen to God, to hear God. We don't do enough of that in the church. We don't do enough of that in the world. So I encourage you first to stop and to listen for God before, before you utter a word, listen for him. And after we stop and listen, we move to adoration, which is just simply proclaiming how great God is. The Lord's Prayer starts with this, hallowed be your name, holy is your name, great are you. It's adoration because it puts us in the right spot from the beginning to recognize that God is great, we're not always great. And we're praying to somebody who is amazingly way beyond what we will ever be. More loving, more gracious, more kind, more forgiving. It puts us into the right frame of mind. And then next we move to confession. I hate to burst your bubbles. You're all sinners. You all sin, each and every day. We all do. I do, you do. And we're called to confess those sins. We're called to seek forgiveness for those sins. And if you don't think you sin each and every day, Ask God to show you how you do, and I promise you he will if you're open to it. And being a sinner, it doesn't doom you to the eternal pits of hell, because we have Jesus Christ. And once we've confessed our sins, then we're brought to the right attitude to be able to show God thankfulness. Because then we really understand what we're thankful for. We're thankful for a God who sent his son, Jesus Christ, to be our forgiveness, to be the means for that, to be that sacrifice in the ways that we can't be. That leads us to thankfulness for how he is active in the world around us. And then, very last, we get to this word supplication. That's just a fancy word for saying, asking for things. Supplicating prayer or supplication type of prayer is just praying for others or praying for yourself. Praying that God would meet the needs 
of your friend, family, whatever it may be, that God would help you get through whatever it is that you're going through. God will reveal whatever it is that you're praying for. But when you do this supplicating prayer, let me encourage you to do it in humility. And pray for others before you pray for yourself. Pray for others before you pray for yourself. Now, I know there's going to be times when you are so overwhelmed by grief, pain, whatever it may be, that you can only pray for yourself, and that's okay. But in those moments that are not like that, which are the vast majority of our life, when you pray and you're asking for something, pray for others before you pray for yourself. Think of yourself less. Don't think less of yourself. Think of yourself less. Because the truth is, prayer can be a few words, or it could be a full-on conversation, or it can just be complete silence. It can simply be, thank you, God. It can be pouring out the depths of your heart. And whether our words are few or whether they're many or whether they're none at all, well, I know this, I know this, is that God loves hearing from us. God loves hearing from us throughout the day, day by day, minute by minute. God loves it when we are open to him and desire to grow that relationship with him. God longs to be a part of our day. And I'm not talking about a little part here where we set aside, I'm going to pray for five minutes here because that's where it fits in my calendar and in my schedule. Now, God longs to be, I'm going to say, the part of our day. And there's nothing too small to pray about, and there's nothing too large for God. Yes, our big prayers, our big asks of God, they're great. And our God is huge. He's holy. He is awesome. But that holy, awesome, huge, and completely, utterly beyond what we can imagine, God longs, desires, and cares to know about you. Little, minuscule, fairly non-important in the grand scheme of things, you. I don't know about you. But I'm excited to hear that God cares enough about me to want to hear my voice, to want my heart to be poured out to him, and to want to connect with me. So church, how do we pray? We open ourselves to God. We make him the part of our day. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.